Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's a, a real pleasure to be here and give a talk to this, this audience. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some work that's joint with Andrea Galliotti at the London Business School, Andrew Coe at MIT, and Wenhao Lee at Penn State. We live in a world now in which internet companies collect vast amounts of data about us and use that data to allow firms across a whole range of markets to target their adverts. Adverts that can and sometimes do include discounts via, for example, discount codes. Is this a problem? Well, most regulators tend to think not, or at least are concerned about undermining the benefits that using consumer information can deliver. So the following is a quote from the Council of Economic Advisors and 2015 report on big data and price discrimination. Economic reasoning suggests that differential pricing, whether online or offline, can benefit both buyers and sellers as described above. Thus, we should be cautious about proposals to regulate online pricing, particularly if we believe that online markets are particularly competitive. And similar quotes are available um, from other regulators around the world, in, including in the UK. It's easy to see the logic underlying this kind of position. So two standard Econ 101 benchmarks are informative. When firms do not know which consumers have which values they, and they have to set a single price to all consumers, there are typically going to be some consumers who are excluded um, from the market. You know, there's gonna be a price that the firm would be willing to sell to these consumers at, but the firm doesn't want to lower its price to, to other consumers. On the other hand, if all firms have perfect information about all consumers' preferences and can set different prices um, to everyone, then firms will compete separately for each consumer and no consumer is going to be excluded from the market. In light of this, it's easy to see that an outright ban on differential pricing can do more harm than good. But these benchmarks are, are restrictive. If we think about an information designer, they have a lot more um, choice than just no information, providing no information or all information to downstream firms. For example, in part to address privacy concerns, um, Google has recently launched its privacy sandbox, which algorithmically groups consumers into what it terms flocks and then reveals only to its advertisers which flock a person belongs to. You know, how should regulators think about this? Okay, so in a moment, I'll go through a very simple example that will help illustrate some of the, the key ideas. Um, but before that, that let me position um, the work that we're doing um, in a, you know, broadly within the, the literature. So I think the following typology can be, can be helpful. And we can think about an information designer with information about consumer preferences in a downstream market. And then for that, the, that broad set of problems, it might be the case that the firms are uncertain about consumer values, or it might be the case that the consumers themselves are uncertain about their values. And we might consider the downstream market being a monopoly or there being multiple firms competing against each other. Okay, and then if we look at the case of uncertain firms and uh, monopolists downstream, then we're in the world of Bergman, Brooks and, and Morris. If we're interested in the monopoly problem, but where the uncertainty is on the consumer side, then we're in the world of Rosler and Sientes. And if we're interested in the case of multiple firms competing, and consumers being uncertain, we're in the world of Armstrong and, and Zoo. And so what we're, you know, where we position ourselves here is that we're going to have multiple firms in downstream markets and our uncertainty is going to be on the firm side. So we're going to, to try and fill the missing, the missing hole in this typology. Okay, so I'd like to start with an extremely simple um, example, but one that illustrates the key ideas in the paper. Okay, so let's suppose that there are two museums, um, a science museum and a natural history museum, and we have an internet platform, and the internet platform knows that Annie, Bob, Chloe, and Denzel are about to visit the city where these museums are located, and they like going to, to museums. Moreover, the internet platform knows exactly how much Annie, Bob, Chloe, and Denzel value a trip to both the science museum 
will return it to, to the Natural History Museum. And we're assuming that they um, each can only visit one of the two. They only have time in their trip to visit either the Science Museum or the Natural History Museum. Let's suppose that there's a price of eight that's charged by both the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum, and that's a standard price that it, it sets for its normal consumer demand that it faces. Okay, and so that's the standard price that Annie, Bob, Chloe, and Denzel would have to pay for admission to either of those museums. Um, if there's no information available about those consumers um, to the Science Museum or the Natural History Museum, if those uh, museums can't target any discounts at those customers. Okay, so we'll start off um, at that benchmark. And in that case, facing a price of $8, we can see that Annie is going to go to the Science Museum, Denzel is going to go to the Natural History Museum, and Bob and Chloe aren't going to go to either museum. Okay, and so we're going to end up with consumer surplus of 16 in this case. So a producer surplus of 16 in this case, and no consumer surplus. And we can see we're inside the efficiency frontier of what we could achieve among these four consumers. Okay. Now suppose that we give the Science Museum and Natural History Museum full information, perfect information. The internet platform decides to tell them both how, you know, who each consumer is and how much they each value going to the Science Museum or the Natural History Museum. Okay, so let's take Annie as an example. Suppose that um, you're the, the Science Museum and you see Annie has a value of $8 for going to you and you know the Natural History Museum is going to see Annie's values too. And then you know that Annie has a value of $2 for going to the Natural History Museum. Then in equilibrium, what would we expect to happen? Well, we'd expect there to be competition for Annie and in equilibrium would expect the Natural History Museum to offer a discount of $8 to offer a free admission to, to Annie, and then the Science Museum to offer a discount of, of $2 so that Annie still is just willing to go to the Science Museum, okay? And you could do the same exercise here for Bob and Chloe and, and for Denzel. And when you do that and you work out the prices that each of the, um, the consumers face for going to the Science Museum versus the Natural History Museum. Uh, you see here that Annie faces a price of $6 for the Science Museum and $0 for the Natural History Museum and, and so on for the other consumers. And now if we look at the amount of producer surplus and consumer surplus being generated, we've increased both the amount of producer surplus and the amount of consumer surplus and we're now on the efficient factor. Okay, so these are just the Econ 101 ideas that I, I mentioned before, right? You, you can start off with a situation where there are consumers being excluded from the market. You go to a world where everyone has perfect information and, and you remove that inefficiency. You get to the efficient front. And, and in this case, you know, there was both an increase in producer surplus, consumer surplus, but that doesn't necessarily happen. Okay, but what if that isn't what the internet company does? What if that isn't the information that it, that it gives? What if instead it groups the consumers into flocks. So let's suppose that it now puts Annie and Chloe into a yellow flock and Bob and Denzel into a, into a green flock. Okay, suppose that when faced uh, with, the, with the information that the consumer is in the yellow flock, the Natural History Museum charges um, a price of six and the Science Museum charges a price of eight. I, I'll just show you that this is an equilibrium. Okay, so if you're the Science Museum, and you know the Natural History Museum is charging a price of six, then you know that Chloe is getting no consumer surplus from going to the Natural History Museum. And so you could set a price of two and a half dollars or just under two and a half dollars and attract both Chloe and Annie. Okay, and if you do that, you're going to make profits of around five dollars on, on those sales. Alternatively, you could set a price of eight dollars and then you're going to attract just Annie, but you're going to make profits of eight dollars, which is better. Okay, so in this case, you, the best you can do is to set a price of $8 in response to the Natural History Museum setting a price of $6. And likewise, if we think about the, natural, the Science Museum setting a price of $8, then the best the, the Natural History Museum can do is to set a price of $6. In order to, to sell to both consumers, it would have to set a price of just under $2, and, and that's less profitable than setting a price of $6 and selling just to, um, just to Chloe. Okay, so by grouping consumers in this way, we've been able to eliminate competition between the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum. 
Annie is paying her full valuation of going to the Science Museum to the Science Museum, and Chloe is paying her full valuation of going to the Natural History Museum to the Natural History Museum. Okay, and here the, the, the case of the green consumers is symmetric, but with the role of the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum um, flipped around. So now when we put this onto our kind of efficiency triangle, or consumer surplus, producer surplus picture, um, we see that we now have producer surplus of 28 and consumer surplus of zero. You know, we have an efficient allocation, all consumers are going to their most preferred museum, but they're all also playing their entire valuation in their, their entry fee. And so all the surplus is coming out of the producer surplus. On the other hand, let's suppose that the internet company grouped the consumers differently. And in the yellow flock, it put Annie and Bob, and into the green flock, it put Chloe and Denzel. In this case, the outcome is rather different. So now in equilibrium, the Science Museum is going to sell to both Annie and Bob, and it's going to sell to them at a price of three and a half, while the Natural History Museum competing for Annie and Bob is going to end up setting a price of zero. Okay, so what, what goes on here? Well, for the Natural History Museum, setting a price of, of, of zero, it you know, can't do better than that, given the, the 3.5 set by the, the Science Museum. It can't attract um, either Annie or Bob at a positive price, so, so that's the best response for it. And given that it's setting a price of zero, then the Science Museum has a, a choice. It could either set a price of six and sell to just Annie. That's kind of the maximum amount that Annie would be willing to pay, given that she has free entry to the Natural History Museum. Or it could set a, a price of three and a half and attract both Annie and Bob. And now it's better to attract both Annie and Bob than to attract just Annie. And so now the mass market strategy is better rather than the niche market strategy. And that generates high, higher profits. And so that's what the Science Museum does. And then for the green, uh, the green flock, it's again symmetric and with, with, with the roles reversed for the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum. And so when you group consumers in this way, you end up with more consumer sur surplus than you got even under the full information case. Okay, so by grouping consumers like this, you actually enhance competition beyond revealing full information. And so you know, what I'd like you to take away from this example is that an intermediary or an internet company that has this kind of information can have a big impact on what happens in these downstream markets can reveal the information in the way that affects competition um, substantially. And then the final thing I'd like to, to, to mention is that there are some properties of this kind of, the flocks that benefit firms and the flocks that benefit consumers uh, that are important and that we will see um, come up again. So in the case of flocks that, that benefit firms, um, consumers are, are grouped uh, together when they have most preferred different products and they're done so in a way that incentivizes this niche market strategy where you end up pricing just to some consumers and not to all consumers in the flock. Whereas when we were looking at the flocks that were, were good for consumers, we saw that they consumers were grouped together who had the same most preferred product. And they were grouped in a way that incentivized the, um, the firms to set a, a, a low price to that group, a, a low enough price that everyone in the group wanted to buy from them. Okay, so they wanted to play this mass market strategy as opposed to a niche market strategy. Okay, good. So those are the basic ideas that are, that are in, the, in the paper. And the rest of the talk is really going to be about how these things generalize and, and what you can say in general uh, about the power of information. Okay, and um, so with that, I'll move on to the formalization of the model and the producer optimal design. Okay, so in, in the model, we're going to have N different firms. They're all going to produce a single product and they're going to produce it at zero cost. There's going to be a unit mass of consumers that all have inelastic demand. So they're going to demand one product um, or the other, or the, at most one product. The consumer types are going to be given by a vector theta where with entries theta one to theta n, where theta i gives the valuation that this type has for consumer uh, for fermized product. Okay, and then f of theta just gives 
the mass in the population of type theta consumers. It's going to be useful to separate out those consumers it's efficient for a given firm I to sell to. And so in other words, those consumers whose highest value is for, for I's product, we're going to denote those consumers by EI, capital EI. Okay, given this environment, what's the information designer's problem? Well, we're going to assume that the information designer has perfect information about consumer types and is going to commit to a signal structure that's going to map um, consumer types into distributions over messages that the different firms receive about those types. Okay, so here we can think about the message space for a given firm I being the unit interval zero one. And then the message space for across all firms is just going to be the product of those individual firm messages, message spaces. We're going to let little mi be a message realization for firm I and capital B and be the set of message functions. Given, so the firm commits, or sorry, the information designer, the internet firm commits to this information design, commits to this signal structure. And then given the messages that are received by the firms, they play a simultaneous move pricing game. And so a mixed strategy for the, for the firms is a mapping from the message that they receive into a distribution over prices that they set. Okay, for you, know, so for each message, you have a, a distribution over prices you set to that, we're given that message. We're going to start off looking at what we call the, pu uh, the producer optimal information design. And this is going to be an information structure that induces an equilibrium in which consumers buy their most preferred product and are charged their willingness to pay for it. So just like in the example we saw, we're going to look for information designs where all possible surplus is extracted as producer surplus. Okay, so the outcome is efficient and there's no consumer surplus left. And what we're going to do is give you, or what I'm going to do is give you a necessary and sufficient condition under which this is attainable um, via information. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to characterize those structures. I'm going to tell you about them. Okay, so let's start off with, with this example. So here we now have valuation. This is an example with two firms, firm one and firm two. And so on this y-axis, we have the valuation for firm one's product, and on the x-axis, the valuation for firm two's product. And then, so these go up in, in discrete increments. So here we have value of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and values of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 for the other products. And then the numbers in these squares represent the mass of consumers of that type. So there's a 0 0.05 mass of consumers that have valuation 0.8, for firm one's product and valuation point two for firm two's product. Okay. Well, then it's going to be useful to think about these efficient sets. Who is the, the, the set of consumers it's efficient for firm one to sell to, or which consumers value firm one's product more than firm two's product? And that's going to be given by this area here, E1. And for firm two, it's being given by this area here, E2. Okay. In this example, this is one of the optimal information designs. Okay, so I just want to talk you through how this works and, and then that'll be instructive for thinking more generally. Okay, so here there are two messages that each of the firms receive. They either receive a blue message or a red message. For the blue message, you can see that, that firm one gets the blue message whenever it's a consumer who has a valuation 0.8 for it and any valuation for, for two's product, or if the consumer has a valuation 0.6 for it, but a valuation for two's product of 0.8. And then what these triangles here denote is that half of the consumers 
who have a valuation 0.4 for one's product and 0.6 for two's product are assigned the blue message. Well, firm one receives the blue message for them. And similarly, half of this 0.1 mass that have a valuation 0.4 for one product and the valuation 0.8 for two's product are assigned the blue signal. Okay, so, and then the information structure is, is symmetric for firm two, but notice it's also, also different. So for this consumer here, they get they might get different signals or um, for this consumer here, one gets the, the, the red signal and the other gets the blue consumer, the, the, the blue signal. Okay, right. So this is an information structure that induces both firms to set a price of 0.8 when they receive the blue signal and a price of 0.6 when they receive the red signal. Okay, that's going to be necessary in order for it to be produced optimal, in order for it to extract all the possible surplus that's available in, in the market, because we need all these consumers up here who it's efficient for firm one to sell for and who have value 0.8 for one's product to pay a price of 0.8. Okay, and, and likewise, these consumers here who have a value 0.6 for one's product. Um, and are uh, sufficient for one to sell to, they have to pay a price of 0.6. So we know that you know, the, these consumers must, you know, the, the, the blue message must be associated with the price of 0.8 for firm one and the red message for price of 0.6 for firm one. And then you know, the symmetric thing is, is true for firm two here. So how does, how does it work? So why does firm one want to set a price of 0.8 or 0.8 in the blue message? Well, if it sets a price of 0.8, it's going to get, and given that the, the firm two is pricing the, the, the way it does, it's going to sell just to these consumers. Um, and it's going to make profits of 0.2 times 0.8. On the other hand, if it deviates to a price of 0.6, then it can steal these consumers away. Notice that firm two is pricing in a way that leaves no consumer surplus for its, its customers. And so in order to steal these, uh, these consumers away, you just have to offer them a price of 0.6 or just under 0.6. Okay, so by firm one deviating to a price of 0.6, it can get an extra uh, mass of, of 0.05 of sales, but it's not worth it. It would rather have sales of 0.2 at a price of 0.8 than sales of 0.25 at a price of 0.6. Similarly, it might deviate to a price of 0.4, then it's going to get some extra demand here is going to get an extra, so half of these 0.2 guys, half of these 0.1 guys, so a 0.15 extra sales at a price of 0.4, but again, it's not worth it. It would rather sell just to the 0.2 massive consumers at a price of 0.8. Okay, and you can do that for the red signal too, and then do the same kind of calculations and show you that it, it, firm one um, doesn't want to, to deviate and set a, set a lower price. Um, for those consumers too. And then the same is, is true for, for firm two. Okay, and, and so this is an information design that extracts all possible, all possible sets. Okay, so what are the key properties of this information design? What are things that must always be true in general and um, that we can see here? Well, the first thing is that Firm I has to be able to distinguish the consumers with different values for its product that it should sell to. I can't give the same message for this for this the, the consumers that have a the firm one is meant to sell to that have value 0.8 for one's product as I give to some consumers firm one is meant to sell to have a value 0.6 for firm firm to one product because then firm one can't extract all produce a surplus, it's going to be impossible for it. If it sets a price of 0.6, it's leaving some gains on, on, on you know, it's not extracting the maximum it can from the 0.8 value customers. And if it sets a price of 0.8, then it's excluding some customers. Okay, so we're gonna have to make sure that those consumers receive different um, different messages. Okay, so that's the, that's the first restriction you must always hold. We're gonna call that separation. Yeah, a second, Almost trivial restriction is consistency. It must be the case that every type of consumer that has positive mass is assigned some message, okay? But if you combine these two things, you can see that it's without loss to let the messages just be price recommendations. 
Okay, so why is it? Well, we, we know that all of these consumers have to end up being charged a price of 0.8. So for all of these, all the messages that these different consumers receive, firm one has to end up setting a, a, a price of 0.8 to them. And for all these consumers, it has to end up setting a price of 0.6. Okay, and then we could, so we might as well give the, the, the same message in those, in those cases. And then for the remaining mass of customers who, who need to be given some message, if I was to give them a message that wasn't one of these messages, then as soon as firm one sees that message, it would be able to infer for sure that the customer is one of these types. And once it can do that, it's going to be able to find a price that it could charge that was uh, uh, going to take those consumers away from firm two. Okay, that's going to undercut firm two. Because firm two must be pricing in a way that leaves no consumer surplus on the table for these guys in order to be achieving this producer optimal information design. Okay, so now we've reduced the problem down to assigning different messages or assigning price recommendations for, to, the, to the customers you're meant to sell to. And all we've got to do now is match the other types to those messages. But we have to do it in a way that's incentive compatible for the firms and for the consumers. So what do we mean by the being incentive compatible for the consumers? Well, if I was to match a, a consumer to a message, so suppose I'm, I'm matching a consumer that's meant to buy from firm two to a message for firm one, but I, I match a consumer that has a higher value for one's product than that message. Okay, so I, there's, a, there's a consumer out there that firm two is meant to sell to, but it has a pretty high value for firm one's product. Let's say it has a value of 10 for firm one's product. And there's some consumers who have a value eight for firm one's product that firm one is meant to sell to and has to give them a message of eight. Now, if I try and match this consumer who two is meant to sell to that has a value of 10 for one's product to the message of eight, then upon receiving it, that, that consumer can guarantee himself consumer surplus of two by buying from firm one. And so we're not going to be able to extract all, all surplus. Okay, so we can't, we can't do that. We can only assign consumers you're not meant to sell to and um, to, to give a message if they have a valuation for your product less than that message. Okay, and then the final thing I want to emphasize is, is what we're going to call firm IC conditions. And that's just going to make sure that given the price recommendation that a firm is receiving, that it wants to follow that price recommendation and not charge a lower price and try to try to steal extra customers away from the other firm. Okay, and so it's going to need to be the case that the inframarginal losses from undercutting, from setting a lower price, so I receive a message MI, that means I'm meant to set a price MI. If I deviate to setting a price P hat I instead, then I'm going to lose this amount on all the sales I would have made if I'd have just set my, my price equal to MI. So that's the set of customers it's efficient for me to sell to um, that have a type of valuation for my product equal to that message. So I lose that on those guys. But on the other hand, if I deviate, I, I steal some business from, from other firms, I need to make sure those gains are smaller than, than my losses that I would occur. What are my business stealing gains? Well, I get new sales at the price of P hat I, at this price I'm deviating to, and then I, I get some new consumers that I attract at that price, and those consumers are consumers that have a valuation for my product that is greater than P hat I and who were assigned that message for me. Okay, so now I'm offering them um, a, a, a price that is below their valuation. And because they get con zero consumer surplus from the other firm at that price, they're going to want to come and, and, and buy from me instead. Okay, so I just need these inframarginal losses to be greater or equal to the business stealing gains. Okay, so what we show in the paper is that a producer optimal information design exists. So that's a, an information design that extracts all possible surplus as producer surplus. If and only if there exists an information design, which for all firms satisfies 
the four conditions of consumer incentive compatibility, firm incentive compatibility, separation, and consistency. Okay, so this is just a technical lemma, really, but it simplifies the problem because now I've reduced the space that I need to look at. Okay, when I'm looking for whether there's going to be an optimal information design or, or, or a producer optimal information design or not. Okay, so now we want to move from there to try and find a general condition under which it's possible to extract all possible surpluses, produce a surplus. And the starting point for doing that is going to be to think about what would happen if we made all the producer incentive compatibility constraints bind. Okay, so let's think about making firm I indifferent between following the, the price recommendation, the given price recommendation he receives, and in undercutting that price recommendation to some amount theta hat i. Okay, so when are you going to be indifferent from that? Well, we can just take the firm incentive compatibility constraint we had a couple of slides ago and rearrange it. And you can rearrange it to find the maximum mass of consumers that you could possibly be able to steal by undercutting to theta hat i such that you still wouldn't want to undercut to theta hat i to make you indifferent between undercutting or not. And we're going, to call, we're going to call that mass gi of theta hat i mi. Okay, so this is the mass of consumers, not in EI, who I is not meant to sell to, or who, whose most preferred product is not I's product, that have a valuation theta i that's between theta hat i and mi. Okay, so after I undercut to, to theta hat i, they have a valuation for my product greater than the price that I've undercut to, okay? And who have been matched to this message MI in the information design, okay? Okay, so now what I can do, so that was for a given message MI, I can now look at all the messages that such consumers might be matched to, okay? And so they're messages that are greater than this, value or this undercutting amount theta hat i, this deviation theta price theta hat i. And if I then sum over all of those possible messages I get, I'm going to get the total mass of consumers who I'm not meant to sell to that have, uh, the, that I could steal, um, or that I, I could, or a better way of saying it is that I, I, I could be matched to these messages, um, the messages that, that I get without, wanting to, to, to deviate. This is the kind of my maximum capacity for matching um, to these types, not in EI. Okay, and so I, I, that's defined as this HI of theta hat I, and it's just found by summing up these GI um, terms over the different messages MI that I receive. Okay, so that's kind of my maximum capacity for matching people. On the other hand, there's a set of actual people I have to match, right? The, the, the set of actual consumers in the population who have values greater than theta hat i for my product and who I'm not meant to sell to. Okay, and the, what's that mass? Well, I just match over the types who I'm not meant to, to sell to, who don't have a highest, who's not, highest value product is not mine such that their value for my product is above this, this deviation theta hat i. And I, I sum over those um, distributions or those, those masses, and that gives me the total mass of people I need to, I, I need to match to. Okay. And then the, probably the main theorem in, the, in our paper says that a producer optimal information design exists if and only if for all firms, and all consumer valuations theta hat i, so all possible values that consumers could have for me, this hi of theta hat i function is greater than or equal to the mass of actual consumers who need to be assigned one of those messages. Okay. So when this condition is satisfied, 
then you know it, it, my job is fairly straightforward. I can just match according to this H function. I can just assign the messages to these consumers I'm not meant to sell to in line with the H function. I might have some spare capacity that I'm not using, but that's fine. I can just you know, not use that capacity. On the other, so that's that's why it's possible if this condition holds to come up with a producer optimal information design. If this condition is is violated, then there's some point at which it's violated. There's some consumer valuation theta hat i at which the condition isn't satisfied. But when that's the case, there are just too many consumers, not in not in EI, that have value from for i's product above theta hat i for me to possibly match to. Yeah, I can use, I can consider all the different possible messages that I could match these consumers to, and I can match you, know, assign as many of them as possible to the, those messages until you know, I'm indifferent about all my deviations, and I'm still going to be left with some of them. Yeah, you know, I'm still going to be left with some mass of such consumers who I haven't been able to assign to a message. Okay, and, and so then it's not going to be possible to come up with a um, producer optimal information design. Okay, so a natural next question to have after presenting this result is, well, that, that's all well and good. Hopefully I've managed to show you or give you some intuition for why, why this result holds. But you might want to know whether it's a stringent condition or a weak condition and for what distributions of consumer values it's, it's likely, to, um, likely to be satisfied. And so I'm going to just now go through some benchmark distributions and, and tell you when, when they work and when they don't work. Okay, so the first case to consider is when we have types uniformly distributed in this unit square. Okay, so when we, so this is the case of two firms, they have valuations um, in, in the unit square that we've kind of shown for the example, we're going to uniformly distribute the mass of consumers over that. In that case, we're fine. And that in that case, the condition is satisfied. The second thing we might do is we might say, well, the hoteling model is, is canonical, let's think about what we could do in, in that space. So now we have types that are um, anti-correlated, meaning you have a high value for one product, you can have a low value for the, for the other product. Um, and then we can uniformly distribute consumers on the unit interval um, or for the, for the hoteling model, again, with two firms. And um, in that case, we're going to be fine too. And then you can go a bit further and you can say, okay, so that the uniform distribution has relatively fat tails, you know, it, it might be intuitive for you that the, the fat tails kind of help because then you have consumers who have extreme preferences for one product or the other. They're going to be good for matching other consumers too because you can charge them a high price and, and without what you can match quite a lot of other consumers you're not meant to sell to to them without wanting to deviate. And, and that intuition is, is exactly right. So what we can do is move away from the uniform distribution and um, normally, or use a truncated normal distribution with mean a half. And in that case, there's going to be a threshold standard deviation um, where the tails are, are fat enough for this to work. And here, the, the threshold is the middle curve that I've, I've drawn here. Um, so just, just between 0.14 and 0.15. Okay, and, you know, and so if we were in the case where the consumers have values that are quite densely bunched around 0.5, then yeah, they're going to be, the, the two firms are going to be close enough competitors to each other that it's not going to be possible to do this information design. Um, you're not going to be able to extract all possible consumer surplus, the, the market is too competitive. Um, but once the tails get a, a little bit fatter, then, then it does become possible to do it. And another and a result from the paper that I'm not going to, to go through, but, but just mentioned, is that, and you can kind of see here, is that as preferences become more polarized, as people put more weight on, on the extreme preferences, then um, it's going to be easier to satisfy the, the producer optimal information design, and that's for any distribution um, that you want. So you take any distribution um, that satisfies it, you put more weight in, in the tails for that distribution in, the, in a certain way that I'm not going to define exactly now, then if you could do it before, you can still do it after you do that. Okay, good. So now I'd like, so that, that's the producer optimal design. Now I'd like to move on to the consumer optimal design. 
If instead you have an internet platform that wants to maximize the consumer surplus of the, the people on its platform, um, then what information design would it use and, and what can it achieve? So the way this is going to work is we're going to construct an upper bound on consumer surplus for any equilibrium. And then we're going to show that there always exist information with structures that achieve that bound. So in the previous case, we had a necessary and sufficient condition for to be able to do the design. You could always do, do the consumer optimal design. There, there are no constraints on when it's possible. It works for any distribution of preferences. Okay. So first of all, I, I'm going to try and construct, or I'm going to construct an upper bound on the consumer surplus that can be obtained in any equilibrium. So a first observation is that if I'm thinking about a given firm, um, a given firm I, and what it can do with the information that I, I give it as an information designer, well, one thing it can always do is ignore that information. It can always ignore that information and set a single price to all consumers, regardless of the message it receives. Okay. If we think, uh, we can then think about, let's suppose a, a firm does that, what price would it set? Well, it's just going to set the price that maximizes its profits, okay? And we can look at what profits it could attain given some prices set by the other firms, okay? Or some distribution of prices set by the other firms depending on the messages if you, if you prefer. A second observation is that these profits that the firm can achieve are always lowered as the other firms set lower prices. And the worst possible case for a given firm I is when all other firms in the market always set a uniform price of zero. Okay, so imagine that all other firms in the market, regardless of the messages they receive, they set a price of zero. You can ask yourself, what are the profits that you could achieve by setting, by setting a single price and ignoring the information you get? That's this pi, R, pi I star of zero, okay? And that's a lower bound on Fermi's profits. It doesn't seem like a very realistic one, but, it, but it's a lower bound on Fermi's profits. And then you can define an upper bound on consumer surplus by taking the total surplus that's available in the market, the total possible gains from trade that are available, and then subtracting these minimum profits that each firm can make, okay? And that gives you some, upper bound on consumer surplus. Okay, it's gonna turn out that there are information designs that always achieve this upper bound. Okay, so how does, how does that work? Well, there are a few steps um, towards doing it. The first thing that the information designer needs to do is to separate those consumers who most want to buy firm one's product from those consumers who most want to buy firm two's product from those consumers who most want to buy firm three's products and, and, and so on. So in this example that we've seen before, they're just, the, just two products. So I need to separate the consumers in E1, that's these five types, from the consumers in E2, that's these five types. Okay, and then if in terms of pairs of types, the blue ones are the ones that firm one should sell to and these red pairs are the ones that firm two should sell to. Then, what you're going to do is try and make firms set a price of zero to those consumers they're not meant to sell to. Okay, so what we want to make sure happens is that for all these types here, firm two sets a price of zero. Okay, that's kind of the best thing that, that for consumers. And so let's assume that we manage to, to, to achieve that then what you can do is you can work out the effective value that each consumer has for buying firm one's product, given that they face a price of zero for firm two's product. In other words, you know, what's, the, what's the maximum price that, a firm, that each of these consumers that should buy from firm one is willing to pay to firm one, given that the price of the second product for it is zero. Okay, and that gives this, so for firm one, that gives this distribution of valuations. Okay, so for the consumers up here, this 0.1 mass have a value 0.8 for one's product and the value 0.2 for firm two's product. There, if the price of firm two's product is zero, the most they'd be willing to pay for one's product is 0.6. Okay, and then for these 
two types of consumers. The most they're willing to pay for, given the firm two's product is priced at zero, the most they're willing to pay um, for firm's one product is going to be 0.4. Okay, and then for these consumers on this diagonal, the most they're going to be willing to pay for firm one's product, given the firm two sets of price of zero is going to be 0.2, okay? And yeah, the same, the same thing for firm, firms two, um, for these types of firm two. Now, what we can do is we can think about the problem in which firm one is a monopolist, but a monopolist in the problem where these are just the effective value, where the, the valuations are the effective valuations. So firm one is a monopolist on these types E1, but where the willingness to pay of the types is 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0.2, instead of their actual willingness to pay. If you cast the problem like that, then it falls into the framework of BBM, of Bergman, Brooks, and, and Morris, and their information design paper, because now it's a monopoly problem with uncertain firm values. And they, um, they've they characterized the, the consumer optimal information designs in those cases. And we can apply their consumer optimal information design to this problem. And we can show that it's an equilibrium here. Okay, and so that's how the consumer optimal information design works. And specifically what happens in this example is that so here you have consumers with valuations 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6 for your product, and you want to set um, prices to them to maximize your profits. How, how are you going to do that? Or you know, that that's what the firm is going to do. So if you're the information designer, how do you group consumers to get the lowest possible price for, the, for, for them? Well, if you put the 0.2 consumers all by themselves, then obviously firm one would, would set a, a, a price of 0.2 to those guys but I can mix in some higher types and the firm is still going to want to set a price of 0 0.2 as long as I don't mix in too many. So if I mix in a third of those consumers that have value 0 0.4 or you know, effective value 0 0.4 for my, my product with all of the consumers who have value 0 0.2, then the optimal price for firm one is going to be 0 0.2. Okay, so they're, they're going to want to play this mass market strategy where they set the low price and sell to everyone instead of setting a higher price. And, and that's kind of the most, the largest mass that I can, I can mix in. And then I, for the remaining consumers, I'd like to charge kind of the least, I, I'd like to get the firm to charge the least possible price of 0.4. And you can check that for the remaining consumers, that's, that's what the firm would want to do. So I don't need to construct any, any more groups. Okay, and, and so, you get these two prices of 0.2 and 0.4, and, and that gives the consumers the most possible surplus they could get. And the way you can check that is that firms are making exactly the, the constrained minimum profits that we talked about before. Okay. Okay, so what have we what have we done and where are we? So I've been thinking, you know, I started off in the simple example by putting these different points on the efficient frontier. What we've done is we've characterized some of these points in general. So there's this full information point somewhere on the efficient frontier. Typically that involves more producer surplus or generically, sorry, I should say, that involves more producer surplus and less consumer surplus than the consumer optimal design we've just been talking about. That's point A. And then there's this point C where there's zero consumer surplus and everything is extracted as producer surplus, and we have a necessary and condition, sufficient condition for that. Okay, so in general, under you know, and for any distribution of types, it's always possible to achieve any point between B and A. Okay, and yeah, I, I can do that just by you know, signing um, people across these two information designs. So I can use a hybrid of the consumer optimal and full information information design to achieve any point on, on the frontier between A and B. And then to achieve any point on the, the frontier between B and C, I, I can also use a hybrid design between full information and, and the producer optimal information design, as long as the necessary and sufficient condition for implementing the producer optimal design is satisfied. Okay. 
And so under you know, when, when you can achieve point C, you can also achieve any point between point C and point B. That condition isn't perfectly tight. Um, there, you know, there, there are weaker conditions under which you can reach these intermediate points on the frontier, but not point C. Um, but those, those conditions are not that um, informative and we haven't found a nice general characterization of them. Okay, and so with that, let me, um, let me conclude and leave time for some questions. And the way I'd like to conclude is by coming back to the properties of the producer optimal and the consumer optimal information designed. So in the case of the producer optimal information design, the way that you set it up is to hinder competition. And the way you hinder competition is by grouping consumers so that firms choose this niche market strategy. They choose not to sell to everyone in their group. They just sell to the consumers with the highest value for their product. Okay, and so in order to do that, you have to put together into the same group, consumers it's sufficient for firm one to sell to and it's sufficient for firm two to sell to or for some for other firms to sell to. And you do that in a way that just incentivizes this or that incentivizes this niche market strategy and then you can achieve the producer optimal outcome. Okay, in the consumer optimal design, this, you know, the, the way it works is rather different. So you're still grouping consumers together, but now you group similar consumers together. You group consumers together who have, whose most prefer, preferred product is the same. And you group them together in a way that the firm that's meant to sell to those, those consumers is willing to sell to everybody in a given group, is willing to play this mass market strategy and set the low price. Okay. And the way, you so it's possible to implement the to always implement the consumer optimal design with public signals. So I can use exactly the same groupings for the different firms, and I can create my flocks, and then I can just tell all the different firms about who's in flock one, who's in flock two, who's in flock three, and it's going to work. So public information works in the consumer optimal case. It doesn't work in the producer optimal case necessarily. Sometimes you, you're going to need to use different groups for different firms. You're going to need to create different flocks for, or you need to create firm specific flocks in order to, to achieve it. And the, yeah, and, and the, the very high level intuition for why that is, is that the public information um, acts as a constraint in, in the optimization problem that you're solving there. So you can reformulate the problem as a linear programming and then it's an extra constraint that goes into the, the linear program. Um, and it's really a constraint on the matching that you do um, that we uh, that I mentioned briefly. Okay, so what do we take away from this? Why you know why have I labored these these points about the the different types of information design that that we have or the different properties of them? Well, if we think about it from a regulatory perspective, then you know you probably don't know whether the internet company is trying to maximize producer surplus or consumer surplus or what combination of those two things. And so in order to understand what it's doing, you're going to really need to understand either the principles underlying its flock creation or how the flocks are being created, how it's doing this grouping. And so you know, this suggests that it's going to be useful to either provide rules of conduct or principles that must guide the, the algorithms that are, that are creating flocks. Possibly that's, that's a bit intrusive. If it's too intrusive, then an intermediate policy that, that's, that's less intrusive that might work is that you could um, have a policy that, that made these information designs of public. So you, you had to create the same flocks for the same firms. And as I, I just mentioned, that is no impediment to implementing the consumer optimal design or the full information design but it does impede the producer optimal design. And it does so by making the firm incentive for compatibility constraints more difficult to satisfy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.